Good morning. My name is Wayne Goodwin. I am chairman of the North Carolina Democratic Party. I was born and raised in rural North Carolina, specifically outside of Hamlet, in a little community called Gao, right on the southeastern border of Richmond County with Scotland County. In fact, some of my earliest memories were riding with my dad as he was driving the tractor on the farm, and we were plowing some rows there uh, when I was a kid. We had a small family farm of about 91 acres, and we grew corn and soybean, watermelon, squash, and lots of other things. And we raised a small number of swine for the local grocery stores. It was a small family farm. Great way to live. Great way to grow up. Like a lot of small family farms used to be and still are in North Carolina. Other members of my family are over in Anson County, and they have been generations of farmers as well. This looming trade issue is deeply personal to me, just as it is deeply personal to thousands of people in eastern North Carolina. Let's remember how this all started. It was all about politics. President Trump was trying to win a congressional seat for the Republican Party in Pennsylvania. He caught everybody off guard, including his own party and his own White House team, and the world with his shoot-from-the-hip plan to impose tariffs on foreign steel and aluminum. And of course, matters quickly escalated thereafter. And they continue to escalate. For example, China has threatened a 25% tariff on soybeans, and also China has imposed tariffs on 128 American goods in retaliation for President Trump uh, and their own escalation of this matter with the Republican Party leadership. They have completely forgotten who they represent. This is impacting farmers across this nation and farmers in North Carolina. And they surely have forgotten that China is the second biggest market for American agricultural products and a major, major market for North Carolina farming goods. President Trump and North Carolina Republicans, through their disastrous anti-trade policies, have put North Carolina farmers directly in the crosshairs of a dangerous and escalating trade war. Their policies will make North Carolina agricultural products cost more, and this will hurt our farmers and consumers in all of rural North Carolina. This damage falls at the feet of every Republican. North Carolina Republicans should stand up to President Trump on this and the other things and abandon their attacks on rural North Carolina and fight for our farmers here in North Carolina. Today, former Congressman Bob Etheridge will share how these attacks on rural North Carolina farmers affect our state and farmers across the country. Then we'll have Tom Butler, a Tar Heel farmer, uh, here to discuss how the Trump trade war and Republican reluctance to lead hurts North Carolina farmers and families on the ground. Congressman Ethridge. Wayne, thank you. And as most of you know, I've had the great privilege of serving this state in a number of capacities. And I currently, in addition to having been a member of the uh, privilege of serving the United States Congress, serve as chairman of Rule Forward, a national group of former FSA and other employees who really are concerned and working on the issues of rural America. And this one issue reverberates all across this country, affecting every state, in every locality, in every community, and ultimately will affect people who sit down to share a meal wherever they may live. You know, this is about jobs. It's really about rural communities. It's about North Carolina, because North Carolina feeds the world. And these tariffs punish local farmers and rural communities all across this nation. You know, we need to remember that North Carolina has been a, a leader and farming has been a staple for our nation since its ex existence, actually, when we became a state in 1789. Through the years, our state's agricultural products have reached every corner of the nation and around the globe. And these farmers and farm groups have worked for years to open these markets. And all of a sudden, with one failed tweet, we could be in deep trouble. Through helpful coordination with U.S. Department of Agriculture, 
North Carolina farmers have survived through droughts, natural disasters, financial downturns, and environmental risks. They are entrepreneurs. They're risk takers. You know, the agricultural sector makes up about 17% of North Carolina's economy, 11% of the total employment in the United States, or 21 million jobs. It's important to support our agricultural community and all the rural communities because those are where the jobs are. And they're the ones who will suffer the most, and they've suffered the most in recent years. Our state consistently ranks, as you've already heard, as one of the top five producers of sweet potatoes. They're in the top with pork, poultry, tobacco, and eggs, and the list is long. Cotton is one of the top exports from this state to China, along with our tobacco. Our state feeds the nation, and our food exports can be found, as I've said earlier, around the world. North Carolina exported about $100 million worth of pork and $156 million in leaf tobacco to China last year alone. Folks, that's real money. And you might ask the question, where are all the other farmers this morning? I can tell you where they are. They're getting ready for a new year. They're out in the fields. Some of them are getting fields ready. They're preparing. They're talking to their, to their financial institution. But farmers today are scared to death. They're frightened because they depend on predictability from their government. And they've already rented the land, bought the seed, bought fertilizer or at least managed for it, opened up lines of credit, getting ready for a growing season. I know a little bit about that. I grew up on a farm. have family members who still farm. And the best thing Washington can do for them is to be predictable. And what are we getting? This is what we're getting from Washington today, chaos. This administration continues to force chaos and confusion on people here in North Carolina, in our rural communities, and across America. Real people are going to get hurt. Jobs could be lost. People are worried about providing for their families. Our farmers and our local communities depend on fair trade practices. Yes. Do we want fair trade? Sure we want it. But there are ways to do it. Farmers in eastern North Carolina and across this country are hanging on by their fingernails in some cases. And what is the president doing? He's cutting off their fingernails. It's going to have real negative impacts. These policies are threatening our farmers, our economies, and our state. I talked with a farmer this morning, and he said, I hope this works out. I agree with him, but hope is not a strategy, and hope is not a plan. We need certainty for our farmers, and we need certainty, and we need positive leadership to make a difference in rural North Carolina. Thank you, and now I'm going to turn it over to a farmer who really knows what it is because he and his family depend on certainty in his operation. Tom Butler. Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Tom Butler uh, from Harnett County, North Carolina. Um, I'm a traditional uh, farmer. Used to be in tobacco and just the cotton, corn, and the whole nine yards. Recently, we've gotten more uh, into pork, um, but this thing is really concerning to us, uh, my community. Um, the, we are already fragile uh, in conditions as far as finances are concerned, and we just cannot stand uh, any more cuts. Uh, if this tariff does go through, which we hope it will not, uh, you're talking about a 25% um, tariff on products that we handle and sell um, it's going to trickle down to us. We always say that we're the bottom feeders, and whatever happens um, will finally come down to us. Um, we do produce pork. Uh, we do it in a very environmental friendly way. Uh, we take our swine waste to make electricity. We do everything we can to help um, 
better our system and sometimes we don't seem to have much help from Washington. Uh, we have to have a dependable atmosphere in DC to make things work on the farm and at this point we do not have that. So uh, I'm like thousands of other farmers, uh, we can be casualties of uh, war of uh, what I say rich people. We're not billionaires, we can't absorb big changes. Um, politicians in Washington, both parties should be really concerned about this. So I hope they will get together and not let this happen. And we need for the government to understand the worth of a family farmer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler, and thank you, thank you, Congressman Etheridge. Republicans must stand up to their own party right now and to President Trump right now and stop these disastrous policies. Democrats are fighting tooth and nail for rural North Carolina. Governor Cooper here in North Carolina has put restoring Main Street at the center of his agenda. And that means Main Street all across the state, in rural and every other part of this state. And here at the North Carolina Democratic Party, we're running local candidates in every single district this year, and these local candidates are pillars in their communities, and many of them are farmers themselves, and each are running local races focused on local issues like these. The Democratic Party here in North Carolina has also launched a rural listening tour. It began a couple of months ago, and we are very excited to hear from people, particularly in eastern North Carolina. I uh, will be returning to eastern North Carolina this week, on Thursday specifically, to hear folks in Wayne County and surrounding counties about their concerns, fears, and hopes. And this topic, the Trump trade war, and the reluctance of Republicans to stand up for our state and for our farmers and for our families, this is one of the paramount issues, and I'm sure I'll be hearing more about it as I go back east again this week. Thank you all for joining us. We will now take any questions that you may have. Um, you repeatedly said this is not the way to do it. There are ways to, to, to better do these type things, but you didn't say what they are. What are the, what, what would you do to help in these, the, these trade deficits that, that, that we're talking about? Well, be before I defer to Congressman Etheridge on this and, and, our, and Mr. Butler, I will tell you that as I said and as Congressman Etheridge said, I mean, the fact that we are in this situation wasn't due to any well-thought-out plan whatsoever. It was due to the, uh, some emotional angst, uh, some uh, unthought-out plan that nobody knew about that President Trump decided to announce to the world and for the first time to his staff uh, just before the Pennsylvania Republican congressional elections up there. Uh, so uh, that's what, something we need to remember, that this is because of the disastrous failure of leadership by President Trump and by Republicans in general. People need to stand up for our farming families and for our state. And I will now defer to Congressman Etheridge to, uh, to specifically answer your question. Wayne, thank you. Thank you for that question. It's very appropriate. Truth is, if you're going to develop a trade treaty, it takes time. You work out the details. Because uh, ultimately, trade treaties run through Congress. First thing the president did when he came in, he did away with the TTP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The farmers would have benefited. There's some give and take and things people didn't like. But at least it took years to develop. You know, it isn't like buying and selling a tenement house that you're going to tear down and build another one. You can't do that in the public. You, you just can't do it. You need to negotiate, work it out so there aren't casualties or unintended consequences because some of this hits our part, trading partners around the world. And it's not being thought through. It needs to be done in a systematic, thoughtful way, working through diplomacy. Uh, that's really how you do trade treaties. Well, you should do them have been done in the past. Uh, I think the uh, unintended consequences of something like, something like this are really bad because history is, there has not been a good predictor because historically when you do things like this, we know what it leads to. A lot of casualties, and the casualties tend to be the people who don't have anything to fight back with, and rural communities are going to be hit the hardest. Did that answer your question? It does, and to, to follow up, I mean, I remember before the elections and when I traveled throughout the state talking to 
to people about you know who they would vote for, why they would vote in this particular way. But they all said, well, Trump speaks for me. So we've got a whole state full of people that voted for Trump. And, and now when you say and, uh, this ain't right, I mean, how are you going to reach those people to say, we need your support in helping us? Well, I think that's a good question. But I don't think they thought, had any idea, that those kinds of things would come and settle on their front doorstep. This is going to have some significant impact. Do we need to adjust trade treaties? Absolutely. But they need to be in a thoughtful, productive way so that the people who are out in the countryside, and this is what we're talking about, because those who live in the penthouses, they're going to be all right. Where the president lives, he's going to be all right. You can't do what he's wanting to do the way he wants to do it. As one person said this morning, I said a few minutes ago, they hoped it'd be all right. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a plan. You have to work systematically through it because there's got to be give and take in trade negotiations. And here we're talking about taking a sledgehammer to kill an ant. That's not what you want to work on. And obviously part of this, the, our rural listening tour, and of course I was doing this even last year uh, as well, but particularly now, is to bring home to our communities and to our voters, regardless of party, that they have been deceived. You know, whether they vote, if they voted for President Trump or voted for Republicans, they were told one thing, but clearly the Republicans and President Trump and his administration are doing something completely different. And it's going to take a systematic, uh, direct approach, and that, that's why my team and Governor Cooper's team and all of us are going where folks live and in their communities and, and hearing them. What were they expecting? What do they need? And what... Uh, what is vital to make sure that farming families in our rural communities and our state's economy isn't damaged for a generation because of this, this, uh, this behavior by President Trump and the reluctance of Republicans to stand up for country first and state first and farmers and families first instead of politics and hyper-partisanship. Mr. Butler, anything you'd like to add to that? No, uh, I, w I would like to address the question about why are, why are we upset about the way they're doing it? Um, I had the opportunity, I have had the opportunity to, to go to D.C. and watch people do legislation and reduce bills and this type of thing, and I would get very frustrated about how long it took and how much time was put in it. But doing that is better than doing it emotionally and through a tweet. And now I appreciate the time it takes to do legislation like uh, trade uh, agreements instead of doing it uh, emotionally. Thank you. Any other, question, any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, Amy Elliott with Spectrum News 14, and this is from Mr. Butler, if you can. Um, how are you preparing in the event that this proposal does go through, or how are other farmers, you or can. can you prepare for something like that? There's, there's not much we can do. Uh, we can uh, depend on uh, our history. Um, I just read an article this morning uh, in Iowa, there's probably going to be 10% of the growers that will just have to opt out because they will not be able to take another cut. Uh, but we, we will just work through it, uh, work with our lenders and our bankers, and uh, they trust farmers and they've always worked with us, but we think it's not necessary. We shouldn't be going through this. Let me just share something, right? because having served with USDA for a few years after I left Congress, farmers across this country, whatever commodity they're in, they're in the third, what we would call a recession. We had one in the 30s, another one in the 70s, and in the third recession where profit margins, margins are the thinnest they have been. And now they're facing some real margins. They're far, farming away what I call, Tom, their equity. They're going to the bank, borrowing money on the equity because the margins are so thin. Well, all of a sudden, one more hit, and we're going to start losing them. And the consumers need to understand that roughly less than 3% of the people in this country make their living on the farm. We're growing food and fiber for the rest of the world. And they're a very small minority, but without them, you know, the reason we're able to be doctors, lawyers, preachers, teachers, and 
live in cities and t- large towns is because these people go out every day and take a chance. If we lose them because someone is using them as a ploy in a bigger game, we all lose. And that has been the foundation and the staple for America since we were a colony. And that's what irritates me so bad, is because they aren't being considered in the front end, they're being considered on the back end. And that's wrong. That's un-American in my view, and we've got to fix it. Thank you. Any other questions uh, this morning? we got time for one more. I guess I'll ask this, because I, kind of, I think I kind of heard it, but I didn't really hear it. For those, and sometimes you watch people who think, well, I wasn't a farmer, don't know anything about farming, that's their problem. Why is it all of our problems? Why, what would you say to that person? Let me touch that, because all of us grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm, and I was able, all, the two of us anyway, Wayne and myself, we were able to leave the, leave the farm. Because farmers are, are entrepreneurs, they really are up to date on technology. I was out on a farm just this past week watching my son and a bunch of folks seed sweet potato beds. Tom knows what I'm talking about. They're producing in large numbers, they're doing the right things. If it were not for this 3% who, are, who have, over the years have really bought into technology, Hog farmers, chicken farmers, poultry growers, fruit and vegetable folks, they bought into technology, they bought into all the new research and development things that have allowed others to go to a grocery store, go down those lines and buy food that is healthy, that, it, that we know is safe, because our farmers do what's right. They're willing to work from sun up to sundown, and the rest of us work by the clock. Many of these people work by the sun, put in long hours. Some people say, well, it's because we love it. Let me tell you something. If we allow this kind of thing to happen to our rural America and our farmers, who are such a small percentage, we could be in deep trouble down the road. Deep trouble. We have not, since the Great Depression, even though we have places where people may go hungry in this country and then there's now argument in Congress whether or not they're going to cut SNAP or food stamps by billions of dollars after they just got through passing the biggest tax cut in history and they want to take it away for off the table, guess who's going to pay, pay a price on that? It'll be the farmers who's providing that food through other programs. That's why it's important to stand up, all of us, because... They allow us to live in cities and do the things we do. I grew up on a farm. I was able to leave because a farmer who used to do eight or nine acres of tobacco is doing a lot more. Those who grew 50 acres of corn is now growing the 1,000, 5,000. Same with soybeans. They should not be used as pawns in a bigger fight for someone else to win. That's wrong. As I close, to answer that question as well, why does this matter? If you eat every day, it matters. If you put clothes on your back, it matters. If you have a a family that's in a rural community, it matters. If you have uh, friends who drive in from rural communities because they can't find jobs in rural communities, it matters. And everybody who invests, whether in the stock market or their 401ks or whatever it is they put their monies into hoping for a better future, it matters to them too. It matters to every North Carolinian. And that's why we're here today. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. And getting the word out. Thank you. Thank you.